like this. Okay, yeah, that's good. <sighs> all right. Um, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation. I am really happy to be here. Uh, my first in-person conference in many years, so yes, really excited. Um, as Natalie mentioned, I'm going to talk about... Um, I'll stop here. Decoupling... on surfaces. So I'm going to start by actually saying a bit about what do I mean by this word decoupling. So this word here refers to properties of configuration spaces. On a manifold uh, or on manifolds um, that actually don't can be studied by separating these two things in a way uh, so that can be understood. By looking at the manifold and points just in our infinity. So this is really weird in a way, and we wouldn't expect this to happen a lot because we're sort of separating the points from the manifold they're in, and by principle, configuration spaces really depend on the manifold they are. So not every property that we look at will have sort of a decoupling result attached to it. Um, but let me give you an example of something that does. So the first theorem of this sort uh, is by Woody Heimer. and Tillman from 2001. And it says the following, if we have a oriented surface of genus G and B boundary components, uh, and this is oriented, um, I'm going to explain this space in a second, but if we look at the configuration space on the surface and we look at the homotopy quotient by the diffeomorphism group, we have a canonical map to this product. And this is a homology isomorphism in degrees increasing at the genus. Okay, so let me first start by recapping what I mean by these spaces. Um, so BDF, you can pick um, the model you like the most. You can think of it as a simplicial space with k simplices given by k tuples of diffeomorphisms. Um, and if you like this, then to get the k simplex here, you just add a configuration of points as well to this tuple. Uh, but we also have a more geometric interpretation, and that may be easier to understand what this map is doing. So a model for this is the quotient of this configuration space of points and embeddings of my surface in our infinity. So if we use this interpretation, an element in here is sort of an abstract uh, manif surface in our infinity without a parametrization, but we know that this is diffeomorphic to FGB, and we have marked points on it. All right, so that's a nice geometric model for this. And what does this map do? So the first coordinate, it forgets the points. 
and it just remembers the manifold as an abstract manifold in our infinity. And the second coordinate forgets the underlying manifold and just remembers the points as sitting in our infinity. And here I'm remembering the tangent space at each point. So that's the map. It's quite geometric. First coordinate forgets the point. Second coordinate forgets uh, the manifold. And this is a homologized homomorphism in a lot of degrees. So, and in particular, if you look at the co-limit where the genus goes to infinity, this is actually a homologized isomorphism. So where does this come from? Well, actually, you can see this as a model for the classifying space of the diffeomorphism group of a surface with punctures. And then homology stability of moduli spaces is giving us this homology uh, result here. But why did I choose to write it like this? Well, because also uh, then we can get inspiration from uh, things we can do to configuration spaces and then apply this result or generalize this result using those inspirations. So as the title of my talk says, I'm going to show that if we look at monoids of configurations on surfaces, we also have a sort of splitting result like this. So I'm going to start by, well, setting up some notation. I already said a few words here, but I'm just going to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, and then um, go into the results. So just to start, some background and notation. So for me, I'm going to denote by C tilde K of W, the ordered configuration space of K points in W. And without the tilde, I mean the unordered. If at any point you'd like me to clarify something, just stop me. Yeah. Um, and now, what do I mean by this? Here I said that we were recording the points in our infinity and also the tangent space. So I'm sort of saying that not only I have a configuration of points, but each point comes with extra information. I'm going to call them labels. So let me make this precise. Let x be a well-pointed space. Um, I'm going to denote by this. Um, the configuration space in W with labels in X. And uh, the picture you should have in mind, and I wish I had colors at this point, because um, you could think that instead of just having a configuration on a surface, um, each point would come with a color, for instance, and whenever the colors matches the color of the blackboard, the point disappears because we can't see them anymore. So that's the idea of the base point. Um, so this is, you take um, all the points and then you quotient out by this base point relation. All right. Okay. I think this is the, all the notation I need to establish at the moment. Um, okay. So I'm going to start now by talking a bit about monoids of configurations in general. Um, so. Where have we seen this before? Um, well, the first place I see, I've seen this um, was in the work of Siegel. So Siegel in 73, he looked at a space he called C prime um, in our N that is homotopy equivalent to the space of configurations in our N with labels in a space X. And it just has one extra feature that allows us to do 
um, to make this into a monoid. So instead of only having a configuration, he also added a parameter here in the first coordinate telling you where the configuration ended. And why is this helpful? Because if we have now two configurations like this, um, we can define our sum to be, well, you stack them one uh, after the other, and the new parameter is the sum. So that's fine. Um, it's a simple way to make this into a monoid. And why was Siegel looking at this? Uh, because he was trying to prove, well, he proved with this. <laughs> so the theorem um, that used this as a technique is that the group completion of this monoid um, is a mapping space of this sort. And you might have seen this before, something like this, because this was the first of many scanning results uh, that related configuration spaces to mapping spaces. Um, if you want to have an, any idea of how you would get from a configuration space a map like this, um, there's a very cute idea. You just think that um, given a configuration space, you can find a radius such that you the points are far apart enough that you don't see any two of them if you take small radius. And um, this component here is telling you where you center your magnifying glass. And this is telling you what you see in your mag magnifying glass. Sort of, that's how you get from a configuration uh, a map like this. All right, so this is a very famous result and it was generalized in many directions. So some names, and I'm probably forgetting a few, um, but Macduff in 75, Budiheimer in 87, Salvatore in 09. These are just some names um, of people who generalized this result. Um, and I must say that the strategy they used to prove this is not via this monoid. They developed another technique to prove scanning results, which is, I think, now when we learn them, we usually learn Macduff's technique of using. Um, yeah, I'm not going into that because we're not going to look at that. But in which directions were these things generalized? First of all, considering more general types of manifolds. And second, something really interesting Macduff looked at is what if we allow the particles to be labeled positive and negative? And as inspiration from physics, we don't expect two positive particles to collide, but we can allow positive and negative particles to collide. So we're allowing some interactions between the points in the configurations. Um, and Salvatore generalized this later on, making precise the idea of what it means to be a partial monoid and have labels in a partial monoid. I'm going to talk about this later. And I'm mentioning these results because although they didn't use this monoid uh, strategy, um, they looked at um, configuration spaces with different labels and different uh, parameters on the labels that was an inspiration for me to look uh, for the generalizations I looked after. So um, I'm going to go back to these ideas. And these ideas also are quite famous now because they developed into things close to factorization homology and the embedding calculus that Boavida and uh, De Vito and, and Weiss are doing. So, yeah, this is the beginning of this story. And on the other hand, we have monoids of manifolds. So here we looked at Rn with this composition, but we didn't have to, right? Whenever you have some sort of well-defined um, monoidal construction on manifolds, we could do the same. So I want to mention the one for surfaces that appeared, uh, was really important in the work of Miller of 86 and Tillman in the 2000s. And how does this work? Well, it's based on this idea that uh, we all have some intuition that the sum of a two surface, uh, genus two surface with a genus one surface should be just a genus three surface. Um, 
okay, so that's fine. Uh, the problem is that if you were just looking at that, well, this is a very boring, bo boring monoidal structure, right? It's just the natural numbers. But by choosing representatives uh, for this things in R infinity, um, we can actually extend this to a monoidal structure on their diffeomorphism groups. So if I have a diffeomorphism, and here it's crucial, I didn't mention this before, but I always think of diffeomorphisms as fixing the boundaries of my manifold. Um, if I have such diffeomorphisms of surfaces, then I can combine them um, here and here to get a diffeomorphism of this big piece just by doing one part on one side and the other part on the other side. Yeah. So, all right, and in particular, we can extend this to a monoidal structure in the classifying spaces. And this is what, um, this is called the surface monoid that was defined by Tillman. Um, and here, let me just say, um, actually, I'm just considering one boundary components, right? So that's what I mean. Okay. Um, this is quite an important monoid, and it was used, like the works relate to the Manfred conjecture, now Mattson Weiss uh, theorem, um, and more, gen more recently it was generalized to higher dimensions. Um, I'm not going to write this down for time, but. Um, Oscar, um, Randall Williams, and Soren Galashes show that the generalization of this for higher dimensional manifolds is crucial, for instance, to understanding the homotopy type of the cobordism category. So these have been quite important as well later on. <sighs> Any questions so far? Yes, a color of the boundary, yes. Thank you. All right, so hopefully, I'm sorry. <laughs> so hopefully with this uh, motivation, Um, I hope it doesn't come as a surprise that we want to define the monoid of configurations on surfaces by taking this sum that was already defined on the diffeomorphism spaces, but also allowing it to extend to um, define a, a sum of their um, configuration spaces. So what I'll be looking at now is to the monoid, um, where instead of just taking the classifying space of the diffeomorphisms, I'm going to take this construction where the manifolds are also equipped with configuration spaces. So the monoid of configurations with labels in X is defined as this homotopy quotient. Um, Okay. Is it clear how things add up? <laughs> Any clarification? Okay, cool. So what can we say about this? So as monoid, this is quite, as a monoid, this is quite different from the product of this and just a configuration space in R infinity. You can just see this from pi one, on one side you have braid groups, the other side you just have classifying space of sigma n's and stuff like that. But on the level of group completions, they are the same. So the group completion of this monoid is homotopy equivalent to the group completion of the surface monoid and the group completion of this configuration space monoid. So 
So here, the intuition should be the same as we had before. One of the maps forgets the points and just remembers the surfaces. That's the first map for, to the first coordinate. And the second map forgets the underlying surface and remembers the points. It remembers the labels on the points and the tangent space that it, the point had in our infinity. OK. Let me give an, an idea on how we can prove that. Uh, because then we also have an idea on what will be harder if you want to try to allow, for instance, labels to collide, uh, colliding labels and colliding points. So just as a start, is the statement clear? OK, <laughs> good. <laughs> Tell me. Ah, so this is C prime, and it's the uh, the monoid defined by Siegel. So C prime, you just add an extra parameter to be able to actually stack them. Thank you. Yes. Any other questions? All right. So first of all, we can define a map of monoids. Uh, just by the way I was describing it. So if I have an element here, it's just uh, sort of this abstract surface well, um, with the points. You can, on one hand, forget the, surface, uh, forget the points, and on the other hand, forget the surface. So I don't want to keep writing these labels all the time. I'm going to denote this by this. <laughs> Uh, so we have these two maps, and these are maps of monoids. Just because the way I defined the monoidal operation was stacking things side by side. Well, for the surface one should be clear because I'm just I used it to define my the one in my configurations. But also for Siegel's one, you see I was just stacking the parameters. So this picture should give you an idea of why um, this respect the monoidal structure. So in particular, if it's a map of monoids, it induces a map on the group completion. And now we want to show that this map on group completions is a weak equivalence. But luckily, group completions are simple spaces. So by Whitehead's theorem, it's enough to show that this is a homology equivalence. And here I mean it's in the simplest way possible, just that it induces a homology isomorphism in every degree with integer coefficients. So, All right. And now, uh, comes a nice part where we know the homology of a group completion. The group completion theorem tells us exactly that. So if you don't know it, it's fine. What does it boil down to? It boils down to showing, so by the group completion theorem, it's enough to show that um, the map on sort of the limit spaces of every part of the monoid is a homology equivalence. And what do I mean by limit spaces? In the end, it would be this statement. Um, this is the surface of infinite genus. is a homology equivalence. All right, so 
Now we just need to show a homology isomorphism for this single space um, that relates to the surface with infinite genus. And um, if we look here, it's very similar to what we had, right, uh, to start with. Because here we had a homology isomorphism in degrees that increased with the genus. So um, in particular, for the surface of infinite genus, this would be a homology isomorphism in every degree. What is different? Here we introduce labels. Um, and when you introduce labels, the configuration spaces are not separated by the number of points like a disjoint union, because you can have 10 points and then one of them, the label goes to the base point and that disappears. So that's a way you can go uh, create a path, for instance, from the space of configurations with 10 points to less. So here we have a result for a fixed number of points. And here uh, all of these are mixed up. But that's fine. We can still deal with that. Um, is it all right if I erase this part? Um, okay, so all right, um, to apply that theorem, which would be really nice, uh, we need to have a fixed number of points, we can create a filtration. So um, we're going to filtrate the spaces by the number of points on both sides. So yn will be all the configurations with at most n particles. Um, and Zn, we can define it as the corresponding thing on the other side. From the definition of the map, we already know that the map between these things respect the filtrations. So this is fine. Um, and using a spectral sequence argument is enough to just understand the subquotients of the filtration. If we show that the subquotients, uh, the map between the subquotients is a homology ISO, then we're done. So our goal now is to show um, that this map is a homology ISO. I'm going to call this 3. Why does this help as well? Now it just comes to the understanding of how we can express this quotient. So this quotient, what is yn quotient out by yn minus 1 is you take all the space of exactly n particles, and whenever one of them gets labeled by the base point, you collapse the whole thing. OK, I can write that in a nicer way. So. I'm going to write this quotient as e to the infinity mm. configurations with exactly n particles um, so here I just wrote it in a way that creates a base point whenever any of the labels goes to the base point. And this maps just includes things to that base point. Um, does this help? Well, I've just found out a way to write the subquotient in a way that the number of particles is fixed which is great to apply what we had before. So I'm just going to do the same downstairs. Sorry, not the neatest diagram, but yeah. So 
Now I have map between these things. And the trick here was just to rewrite that subquotient in a way that we can only look at a points with a fixed number of particles. But then that's fine, because this map, one, is the one we had in the theorem above. So um, if I call this two, um, this is not too far off from there. Maybe if you believe that one, it will be easier to believe that two is also a homology isomorphism, but I proved that. So by the result of Goodyheimer and Tillman, and this part, is, I've done this as well, um, one and two are H star isos uh, equivalences, which implies three is a homology equivalence. Yeah, sure. It's just that you can, uh, from a filtration, you can construct a spectral sequence that converges to the homology of your whole space, and the entries are exactly the homology of the subquotients. So if I show that the map between the subquotients is a homology iso, when you plug this into the spectral sequence, all the entries will be the same, and the maps between them will be isomorphisms. So yeah, without going into the details, is that help? OK. All right, any other qu any questions at this point? Okay, um, maybe it's a bit hard to see, but yeah. Um, what was the key step here? The key step was to understand these subquotients and being able to rewrite them in a way that uh, only uses particles with a fixed number of points. And why were we able to do this? Well, because we understood really well what it meant for a, po a configuration with n points to decrease the number of points it has. It only happens when one of the labels go to the base point. There is no other way this can happen. So if I write things like all of, the, all of this quotient now is happening in this parameter, um, because I'm saying, like, well, that's where magic happens, where think in, things can have a lower number of points. So that's what allows me to rewrite things in this way. Why am I talking about this? Well, because when we allow labels to be like plus and minus, for instance, like Macduff did, you can see that that's not the only way particles will disappear. You could have 10, part, 10 points in your configuration, and then to collide, you have eight. So now, if you want to understand these quotients, they will be much, much harder. So I will talk about this part now. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions on the proof, please let me know. Um, all right, so oh, part three is partially summable labels. Okay, so first of all, I just let me make this precise. Like, what do I mean by partially summable? So, um, I hope you all, or most of you, have seen what it means to be a um, demonoid. So, would anyone here like me to give an example or some intuition behind this? Yes, perfect. Okay, so. Um, being, a being a monoid means you, ha you can add stuff. If you're a demonoid, you have a d-dimensional way of adding stuff. If you want a baby example, but I find it helpful, imagine you have two drawings, and you want to create another drawing around it. Well, that's fine. You can put them side by side like this, or you can put them like this. You have a two-dimensional way of stacking them together. In maths, when do we see this? Well, two loop spaces, right? If you have a map from S2 to X, 
in another map from S22X, you can construct a new one by stacking them side by side, but you could do this in a two-dimensional way. So this is the intuition behind being a two-monoid. And if you're a d-monoid, you have a d-dimensional way. And the, yeah, the canonical examples are loop spaces. A one loop space is a one monoid, a d loop space uh, is a d-monoid. Um, the cool thing is, like, if we're adding things on surfaces, for instance, the labels of our particles, we would like to be able to say, oh, they have a two-dimensional way of colliding. So this is exactly the setup. If you want to have a rich structure, we want to allow things to have this structure. OK. Um, how do you make this precise? <laughs> well, to make this precise, we, use, uh, we look at them as algebras over the ED operand. You don't need to know what this is <laughs> at the moment. Um, but basically, this is saying that um, the, um, this records ways you can compose k elements. Um, so to give the structure of a two-monoid, you have to say that you have uh, d-dimensional ways to add stuff. So, but if you have three things, um, you also have to I attacked you. I'm really sorry. <laughs> Uh, you have to give away. OK. <laughs> um, if you have three things, you also want to add them up. So anyway, you want to do this for any number of things. Um, you want to, if you have a demonoid, M, and I'm going to have a unit. So this will be a base point in M. Um, this is telling me all the ways um, I can add k stuff, k things. And ED is recording me, OK, if you want to give me a D monoid, you have to give interpretation for all these ways of adding things up. OK, so, so ED algebras is a collection of maps like this that are compatible with the structure of an ED operand. OK, if you have this picture in mind, this is fine. So how do I define a partial D monoid? So instead of having uh, results for multiplications of any elements, I will define a subspace of what is composable. So I have an inclusion of what are the composable k things. And then instead of having a map from all of this to m, giving the result of composition, I have a map like this. Let's see some examples, because we're not going to use it in this level of detail, but just to give an idea on how you can make this precise. So, well, examples one should be MacDuff's uh, uh, label. So we have minus, we have zero, we have plus. And now, what are the composable two things, for instance? Well, it's the pairs. Well, everything should be composed with the unit, that's fine. Uh, you have minus with plus. You have plus with minus. Um, and just to be complete, I'll write this too as well. But you have nothing else. So plus with plus is not composable. Minus with minus is not composable. Um, and hopefully you, you know the result of these compositions, which means giving this map here. All right. Um, one slightly more interesting. Um, let's say we have M, and this is a non-commutative monoid. So think of, I don't know, can think of the space of matrices as your favorite example if you want. And let's say we want to use this to label particles in a two-dimensional space. Well, if they're colliding like this, so here I have a matrix, here I have another one. If they're colliding like this, like in this line, then you can say, all right, I will do this multiplication by saying it's m times m prime. OK. Yeah, question? Um, yes, I mean, that's a, a, a good question. Um, but yes. I mean, it depends on how you set this up. In this case, yes, because. Okay, so you got to put equal prices by a different uh, button. Yes, yes. And to give a partial monoid is to give all of them. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Yeah. 
Okay, so if they're aligned like this, you might think, okay, I'll do m times n prime. Um, but what if they collide like this, for instance? Which order do I choose to make this, uh, this composite, right? I mean, it's not obvious. Um, so one way we can make this more uh, work as a space of labels is to, for instance, not only use the matrices, but also have them with a vector. And this vector is sort of telling me that if things approach this way, I can compose them, sort of. So you can say that things are allowed to compose if their vectors match and they approach each other via this vector. And once that's the case, you know how to compose them because you sort of have an order that you can use. So that's a less trivial example. Um, so partial monoids, well, uh, I'm using the setup of Salvatore. He's the one who like generalized uh, Macduff setup to this higher generality, and he showed that the scanning results uh, work in that setting as well. So we can define now um, for P a partial uh, D monoid. You can define a configuration space with summable labels in a manifold W that is D dimensional as um, and I'm go not going to write it down all the details because this is made precise using the Fulton McPherson operand and so on. You don't need to worry about that. What is the intuition behind this configuration space where particles are allowed to collide whenever their labels are summable? And here, um, you really don't need to think like, there's room for a lot of structure here, because you can say um, <laughs> that something might be summable, is it, as in this last example, if they approach each other in one way, but not if they approach each other in the other way. And you also want to, the particles to take care of that. So this encompasses all of this. Uh, yes? Yes, so um, this is made precise like w why, with the hands-on actual construction. Like instead of using the configuration space, you use the um, uh, Fulton-McPherson compactifications. And then you have maps from the Fulton-McPherson operat to the compactifications and also to the space uh, using this result of this sort, right? So if you use the Fulton-McPherson operat, um, you have some elements that will compose, and then you quotient out by these two things. Um, yeah. I don't know, think I can make this more precise without going into the details, but I'm happy to talk about this later. Uh, all right. So now I guess you all know what I want to do. I'm going to def define a monoid of configurations with summable labels. So here is a partial. And since I was talking about surfaces before, to monoid, if I have time, I can comment how all this story generalizes to higher dimensions. Uh, what will this be? Well, again, I just take all the summable labels, um, all the configuration spaces. All right. Okay, what can we say about this now? And crucially, this is much harder than before. Because now, um, if we don't put any conditions on the partials, the, on the labels, the going from one part of the filtration to the next could be as messy as you want. But still, <laughs> what is nice is that this still splits. In one hand, we'll have the surface monoid. 
and the other one will have something, and I'm going to explain this in a moment. But again, forgets the surface and only remembers uh, points in our infinity. OK. So I'm going to use the rest of my time to get an idea on how you get this result, because the technique is actually really cool. I really enjoy it. Um, what is the problem, then? Is that we don't know how to go from one step of the filtration to the next, uh, because things could be almost colliding everywhere. I mean, if we have um, a surface like this, well, um, you can say, oh, this if it was just about the labels, you can say, oh, this label is close enough to the base point. It's about to disappear. It's easy to do that. But if they could collide, you could say, oh, these are almost colliding. But I don't have a metric. This could be almost colliding as well. Like Things could be almost colliding everywhere. And that's what's hard to keep track here. So we do that by adding loads more structure and getting something weakly equivalent. So. Um, so why am I just mentioning uh, this part now? Because all the other parts of uh, stages of the proof should follow the same way. Uh, in particular, uh, still the only thing we should we're left to prove is this statement here: that on the level of infinite genus, uh, we have a homology isomorphism. We just can't use this less uh, strategy. So. The way you do this is using a semi-simplicial resolution. So just as a recall, so we're all on the same page, uh, for a simplicial space, we just needed to define a functor from delta op to spaces. And this came with phase maps, degeneracies, and everything. What is a semi-simplicial space is a functor uh, from the subcategory where I only have injective morphisms. So here, I forget all the degeneracies. I just have phase maps. And you might ask, why would we do, why would we do this? Um, like, when we first learned algebraic topology, we had simplicial complexes that just had face maps, and then we went through all the trouble of adding the degeneracies, and now you're taking them away again. Um, so they work well in some situations. So nice properties that I'm going to use today. Um, so one of them is homology equivalences can be checked level-wise. in the sense that um, if I have a map of semi-simplicial spaces uh, such that for every k, uh, this is an h star equivalence, then this implies that I have a homology equivalence on their realizations. And the realization is defined uh, the same way we did for the semi-simplicial case. So just without the degeneracies. Um, so that's the first thing. And the second point is good for construction. Resolutions. And what do I mean by a resolution? I mean, um, so a resolution of Y, a space, is a semi-simplicial space, x bullet, such that um, we have an augmentation map, so all the simplest levels map to y, and the map induced on the geometric realization is a weak equivalence. 
And why do I mean that they are good for constructing <laughs> resolutions is because there's a theorem of Oscar uh, Randall Williams and Soren Galatius that uh, gives us very nice ways to check when we've constructed something that is a resolution. Okay, so I want to use this. What is a resolution we can use for a space? So as I mentioned before, the problem was that things could be almost colliding everywhere, and I didn't know where they could be colliding. I'm going to add this data to my resolution. So if I had a surface with points everywhere, I'm going to ask disks around this configuration marking the possible collisions. So I'm going to define a space d sigma for disks of um, embedded disks around configurations of my space. And why did I put a this thing over embedded. Um, I want the embeddings, but I don't need all the information of the embeddings. I just need sort of like the lines going through the origin all the way around. I don't need to know where exactly did I take zero, uh, the, the first coordinate, or so on. So it's embedding mod the GLD action. <laughs> no, I mark all of them. Because the thing is, since I didn't put any restriction on my partial monoid, I could have like, oh, this is not possible to collide, not possible to collide, not possible. Oh, now it's possible. So you have to be around all of them, because it's really hard to have a neighborhood of almost collisions. Yes. Um, no, I mean, you can have any disk. Um, and yeah. And of course, whenever, uh, if I have a configuration and its label goes to the base point, the point disappears, and the disk allows, is allowed to disappear as well. So I, I quotient out by the same relation I had before. Um, OK, how do I get a resolution from this? Well, this has the structure of a post set. Um, so what is an element here? It's a configuration with a collection of embeddings, or, or embedding of a collection of disks. I'm going to say that this is smaller than this. Uh, first of all, I only want to compare things that are surrounding the same configurations. So when c equals c prime and um, the image of the first embedding contains the image of the second one. So I'm sort of like refining the way I'm thinking of compositions. So yeah, in particular, if I do this, um, I have something. Uh, a pair of, of this sort. And now I can just take the nerve of this. So let this be the semi simplicial nerve of this post set. And what does it mean? I mean, if you just want to have an idea of what a k simplex would be, it's a k plus one tuple of elements that were one less than the other. And the image would be like k plus one layers of disks contained in one another. Uh, all right. The result is that this is actually a resolution. So we've added all the structures of disks surrounding them, but we still end up with something weakly equivalent. And I'm going to finish 
by very quickly saying uh, why we're done now. <laughs> um, all right, so all we needed to show was that on the infinity uh, genus level, the map was a homology equivalence. Oh, sorry, I didn't tell you what would come this way. I'm, I'm gonna do this now. I had left a, a box. <laughs> so it's easier understood now if we have this interpretation. So with this interpretation now, I'm just gonna think about this as this disks. And what is this map doing now? Well, on one hand, I forget all the disks and all the configurations. And on the other hand, I only remember these disks and the configurations. So I'm gonna denote this by uh, the sigma again, and I'm gonna put a two to remind us that we're still looking at two-dimensional disks. Okay, and now this is an H star ISO. Um, and then quickly, sketch of proof. Um, we can now work level by level because of this nice property of semi-simplicial spaces. So all we need to check is that um, on k sets for every k, um, this is a homology ISO. And let's just do this for uh, the zero um, simplices, just to have a sanity check. Um, so for the zero simplices, yeah, I'm just gonna do zero here. What is a zero simplex? Well, from my definition, it was just one element of this post set, right? So it's just a configuration of points with embedded disks around it. And now we can change perf perspective a little bit and think that, well, instead of having just um, seeing this as a configuration with disks around it, I could see this as disks with, config or with configurations in a disk around it. Is the change of thinking of like this as a, yeah, the disk as extra structure or the disk as giving you a base point and the label on that base point is the drawing in the disk around it. So what I'm saying is that this space is actually just configurations and now since the disks are embedded, I don't have collisions anymore. Configurations in F infinity, where the points are labeled by configurations in disks. And now what happened is that all the collisions are happening in the labels and our configuration space doesn't have collisions anymore. So we can apply the previous theorem. Um, so in pictures, this is what would be happening in level zero. So we have the disks, and now all these drawings would be labels on the points. And in level two, this would be happening. This would be the labels that would be around them. And I'm um, done, thank you. Yes. Oh yes, great, great question. So basically, how do we get this theorem? Um, it comes from the homology stability of moduli spaces. Well, here is just the mapping class groups. And exactly the one that says that if you have uh, boundary components, and you close them off, or at least close down one of them, this gives you a homology isomorphism. 
So um, the first thing here is to see that if you have marked points, this relates very easily to marked boundary, just by um, the only difference in the diffeomorphism is what it can do to the tangent space, right? So once you fix what it does to the tangent space, um, it's the same as replacing this to a marked boundary. So this is doing this part of fixing the tangent space, and then you apply this on the fiber. Thank you. Yes? Um, yeah, <laughs> I was looking at it. Um, I mean, there is definitely some relation because uh, what if construction, the monoid of configurations is a monoid over the surface operad, and you can look at what is, how it splits via Tillman's approach. Um, but you can see that it's not the same because in here, uh, the free E infinity algebra you get carries the labels of the tangent space as well, which I don't think happens in, in Tillman's result. Interesting. No, that's a that's a good approach. Yeah, but that's definitely a test case that we should look at because if we take x to be s zero, then what we get is precisely surfaces with punctures as a monoid on the side, comparing it to surfaces without punctures and points in our infinity. So that would be a great test case to see if that holds. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. No, it's not. Yes, so this is one of the nice things about semi simplicial ones. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, but I, so this is the first idea that we had, like can we put disks around things that could collide? But since we're working with any partial monoid, this is really hard to control. As what I was saying, like things cannot be colliding, but you have a path to things that collide. So how do you do that with the disks? You say, I'm not allowed to have a disk between them two, but then when it changes a bit your R, like this would be very clumsy, and then what we do is put disks around everything. And maybe you're putting disks around stuff that will never collide, but that's okay. That's what this theorem shows. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Thank you.